morning and welcome. My name is Vincent Leung, doctoral student in Romance Languages and Literature here at Harvard University. And today it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor uh, David Lummis of the University of Notre Dame, who has come to talk to us about uh, his recent publication published in 2020 entitled The City of Poetry, Imagining the Civic Role of the Poet in 14th Century Italy, which figures as part of the, the Cambridge series, Cambridge Studies in Medieval Literature. Um, the work is also notable for the fact that it was recipient of the 2019 Modern Language Association Aldo and Jean Scaglione Prize uh, for Best Manuscript in Italian Literary Studies. Um, Professor Lomas, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Vincent, for having me. It's a pleasure to, to be here to talk Absolutely. about my book. Absolutely. Uh, so I suppose my first question is that um, it appears that throughout your book, uh, many of our poets' conceptions of poetry relate to these very negotiations between social class and authority and often lack of authority given the, the lack of uh, the poetic profession. Um, in the era. In the case of Dante, his identification of with minor nobility, as has been written by some of the most notable biographies of Dante uh, throughout the past few centuries, and things specifically of Sant'Agata and Scherido, um, but also a very recent biography, such as the one published this past year by, um, by Giulia Lanomiani and Elisa Bridi. Um, these biographies have, have, have noted that uh, throughout the works of Dante, um, that there are many exaggerated elements within his works that aim to project him above his real social status and to lend him authority. Um, as you've demonstrated throughout your chapter of Musato as well, uh, he was deeply involved in Padawan political life and therefore it's not extremely difficult um, uh, to see his evolution into the poet of the city as you uh, have dubbed him. Um, so my question is, is it possible here to separate poet from uh, a social and political animal? Um, if not, how does this possibly inform our approaches to reading their poetry and their defenses of poetry? Thank you, Vincent. That, that, that's a great question. Uh, I don't think it's possible to separate uh, the poet from the, the political or civic animal, I guess, the, the civic context in which they, in which they write. Uh, that's the, one of the sort of underlying arguments of the book, that um, we need to consider uh, these individuals as historical people. and. Um, as much as possible, as much as we can learn about their biographies and um, understand, to, in order to understand the impact that they saw their works having uh, in, uh, in the world in which they lived. And it's not just about the future, about the, the projection of the uh, artist's will or autoritas or authority into, um, you know, an ahistorical or atemporal field, right? That, uh, that it's always rooted in a context. Um, I think that this issue is especially problematic for poets like Petrarch, um, <laughs> you know, uh, who um, fashioned you know himself as the, the the poet for posterity, the intellectual for posterity. That he was out of his own time; he was inactual, right, or um, untimely. Uh, Dante is similar because we don't know very much. I mean, I, I've always followed the biography of uh, Giorgio Inglese uh, since it came out because it's so sparse, right? He's very clear about what we do not know, <laughs> right? So he, he holds himself to that, uh, to that idea. And how does this affect how we think about his, um, about these poets' works? Uh, well, I think, I don't know, I don't, to historicize them is, is necessary. You know, I'm not, I'm not a positivist critic, right? I don't think that, you know, we can only understand uh, their works, you know, um, as they understood them. I think that something escapes, you know, and, and there's, a, we, there's a reception happens, and uh, they, they surely thought about their own reception. But I think we can understand their works, the more we can understand their, 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 how they thought about their own works, impact on their own world, um, the better we can relate it to our own, right? That, that, that it, it, it's rooted somewhere um, in something real and not um, free-floating <laughs> ideas, a free-floating idea. Absolutely, and I think that's what's uh, extremely beautiful about your book. It's, it's the exploration, the way in which they respond to social, political, ethical, and cultural challenges and shifts um, that they encounter within their own civic context, mm -hmm. and, and the way in which um, they not only respond to, uh, to these very elements of their society, but also respond to each other. Mm -hmm. um, would you mind going on a little bit further about that as well? Yeah, sure. Like, like, I can talk a little bit more maybe about the defense of poetry, yes. which I didn't mm -hmm. answer in, your, in the, the last part of your question. Um, you know, those, those works have been always considered, so there's a, a subgenre of, um, of, sort of proto-literary criticism in which um, scholars of humanism, scholars of uh, intellectual history are interested in tracing the secularization of uh, culture from the Middle Ages through the Enlightenment, through Romanticism. You know, I've seen these defenses of poetry where uh, 
uh, poets like Musato or Petrarch um, call poetry a theology. They, they try to um, uh, champion the production of, classic, of, of, of uh, classical literature, of, uh, of art. And it, it's, it, it's been taken out of context. It's been put in a trajectory that has eradicated it from the world in which it was thought out. And like the, the yeah. actors that participated in these kinds of debates, weren't, it wasn't a purely intellectual game, right? It was a political, civic discussion, right? Because, you know, one of the issues is I think that you know, we projected onto the past this, I, this notion of a public sphere, right? Which didn't exist in the same way it does today, right? Where anybody can just have a say and gain a million followers, <laughs> right? I mean, you had to have some sort of institutional, um, an institutional background, institutional authority in order to Absolutely. have an impact. Yeah. And I think that, um, um, that that's what these defenses of poetry are doing. If we understand that, then maybe it will help us understand you know, how, we, how we gain authority. But I think what, what is the authority of a, of a poet or an intellectual today? So we can look back on it in that, in that, in that way. We understand what the impact of these people um, Ha like what impact they had on, on humanism, for example. Mm. Um, and that's just been kind of elided by these broad historical um, treatments. But uh, in terms of how they relate to each other, um, Musato is kind of an outlier, <laughs> you know, because um, you know, he's, he's the non-Florentine of the three, <laughs> right? That's the, the three, clowns, three crowns of Florence. Um, uh, so how much they would have taken into account uh, Musato, I don't know, um, but Dante was definitely, for the, the last two poets that I consider, Petrarch and Boccaccio, mm. was definitely at the center of this other debate that was going on. And I, and the way I portray it, the way I see it, the debates on the value of Dante, the vernacular of the Latin, for example, are all a part of something much larger, which is, what is my public? You know, who am I claiming authority over, right? Uh, who is giving me authority? And I think that that, um, that negotiation always goes back to Dante, mm. and I think Musato, especially for Petrarch knew Musato. He was in Padua. <laughs> you know, there, uh, it was, it, he was a model that they that oftentimes went unacknowledged. Um, and uh, uh, so for me, like they were all in dialogue with each other. And uh, the first two, Dante and Musato, sort of set up two different poles. You know, the, someone who's on the margins and someone who's in the middle. And I think the, the latter two poets, Petrarch and Boccaccio. Whether or not they're thinking of Musato and Dante in particular, and I think they are a lot of times, um, kind of negotiate that um, center-periphery uh, kind of dichotomy, right, mm -hmm. that the other two poets had, had sort of, in which they had established their own authority. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I see what you mean, that they somewhat live under the shadow of Dante following <laughs> um, his promotions of vernacularity, especially in these responses that mm -hmm. Petrarch um, levies on <clears throat> in his alignment with uh, Latinity. Um, but on, on, on the theme of, of the co-opting of institutional and civic authority mm -hmm. by poets uh, in the redefinition of their own authority, um, my second question would be, given the rise of the Poeta de Orogus, did civic and governmental institutions take notice of this? And if so, how were these poets uh, weaponized by state actors mm -hmm. in somewhat of an early politicization of aesthetics in a Benjaminian sense? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, were they... Were they weaponized by a state <laughs> kind of situation? Um, and it, you know, do they? Um, I think they weaponize themselves to a, to a certain extent, right? That they they are the ones who somehow feel like they need some sort of status, and so they go through a, a kind of process in which they establish the office of the poet, which is an imaginary role, right? Um, as a kind of institution. One of the ways that they do that is by, by um, calling themselves theologians, right? And saying, and either saying that poetry is like theology or is the same thing as theology, uh, so that they have a uh, ground to stand on when they try to offer interpretations of uh, uh, the historical events, current affairs, and offer um, really ethical advice, right? So that it's, it, poetry is a kind of part of ethical philosophy mm -hmm. at, in, during the Middle Ages. And I think at this moment, um, it's, it's a way of trying to establish, of, of establishing the poet as a kind of moral authority, right? Uh, much in the way that the humanists will do in the, in the 15th century, but here they're really not making claims for poetry to court. It's for poetry um, to be um, 
to, to, to grant them that kind of role. So they build up the discipline of poetry in order to achieve a kind of uh, social role equivalent mm -hmm. to that of a theologian, right? Or, um, or, or something of, of that sort. I think that um, um, in terms of institutional co-opting of these figures, I think that was going on, I mean, perhaps it was already going on with Dante and in, in Verona and Ravenna, I and mean, that's the sense that you get from the, from the exchange with Giovanni de Virgilio. <clears throat> and he, he, Giovanni de Virgilio in Bologna accuses Dante basically of staying in Ravenna because he's, you know, <laughs> because of the, the Lord, because of the Polenta family, right? Uh, from Guido de la Polenta is you know, keeping him there, right? Um, and that's a better option for him. Um, and so he's accusing Dante of having been co-opted by the Polenta. And so, um, but later on there's, for example, um, during, in 1355, um, after Petrarch's coronation oration, uh, coronation uh, oration in 1341, um, Zenobia da Strada, kind of minor, <laughs> minor poet, is like a kind of a, a nice thing to say about him. But he's he was a no one basically, and he was crowned poet laureate in Pisa by the um, German emperor Charles the Fourth, I believe, and. Um, he, there was a scandal. All of the Florentines, all of Petrarch's friends thought that, you know, he was, Pe Boccaccio thought that he was doing this for the money, that he was doing it for the fame, and even though he had nothing to stand on, he, it was just an empty gesture, right? Mm -hmm. But what did that mean in terms of the, how the, the, the political element was making use of the figure of the poet, the figure of the intellectual? Um, I, I think that, is it a politicization of aesthetics or a politicization of that role itself, right? Of that, um, of that name of Poeta, right? I think that may be what's going on there. Right, absolutely. Um, so in your section describing Boccaccio's defenses and conceptions of poetry expressed in De Genealogia de Orum Gentilium, mm -hmm. um, there, there really is this idea of, well, a Dante and Barolinian deconstruction of, of authority for the rubber stamping of one's own authority, much as is the case with many of our other poets. And so my next question is, to what extent does Boccaccio's invective here against the academic figures of the newly established Florentine studium mm -hmm. um, represent an insecurity expressed towards the rise of new institutionalized powers? In other words, I wonder whether or not this is an early negotiation between the Italian public intellectual poet mm -hmm. and the university. Right, well, that's a great question. It mm -hmm. certainly looks like that, doesn't it? Right. Right? The way he sets up that defense, uh, the, it's a defense of poetry that acts as a critique of every single individual in society from the ignorant, mm -hmm. right, uh, to the false wise, to lawyers, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then to the philosophers. And I interpret so that he ends up basically addressing his entire defense of poetry to the philosophers mm -hmm. uh, there. And, and so he's critiquing um, not the good philosophers, not the people who are, have an, sort of an ethical core and a dedication to learning. He, he talks about this in terms of the house of philosophy, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's almost like an allegory. I interpret it as the Florentine University. I don't think everybody's going to agree with that, but I think I think what's I think that's that's what's happening, right? That that he's um, picking out two kinds of professors, right? Two kinds of learned men. Um, one of them, uh, one of the one of the groups, uh, are those who gather titles and walk around uh, with no actual learning and walk around professing like they're some sort of, um, you know. Uh, God's gift <laughs> to humanity, right? Yeah, right? And and so I think, uh, and the other um, are are uh, those who um, you know who are in it for the. I think they're basically in it for the money. So you have this. What's wrong with this is that there's some kind of payout for that. There, there's there's either a lack of of dedication to true mm. learning, mm. And, and so the institution somehow corrupts the intellectuals engagement with ideas mm -hmm. and the intellectual's ethical um, commitment, right? So you can think, think about it in terms of empeño. I think what Boccaccio, you, you can translate that into empeño, basically, so this idea of intellectual commitment. Uh, and so I, I think that it's a great analogy, right, um, that Boccaccio, who is at that point in his career, you know, not exactly a, an institutional figure. He does become one towards the end of his life, right? He's hired to give lectures on the Divine Comedy, but he's struggled you know, for a good part of his time in, in Florence to bring some kind of culture there, whether it was Greek culture or um, 
Dante, or he tried to get Petrarch to come to Florence several times to teach there, to, to give lectures, which he was allowed to do because he was a poet laureate, right? He had a, he had a diploma that said he was allowed to profess poetry uh, and read poetry, to claim poetry. And so, uh, so I, think was, I think it's a great analogy to think about Boccaccio's critique of these institutionalized figures of learning mm. from, a, from an ethical perspective, right? That they uh, have betrayed their um, commitment to the ideas and their commitment to the people. And this is what his, the figure of the poet may be him. He's very, he's very modest and he never, you know, brings him, he never puts himself in that spotlight. It's always Dante or Petrarch or other people. But I think that's exactly what he's trying to do is to create a space outside of an institution, external institutional institution, if you will, that can engage in public debate. And if you want to call it the public sphere, then we, I guess we can. But I think there, the, the titles and the and the, the the process that's going on is a is a process of institutionalization of professionalization that I think will will, will come about, you know, in a few generations. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, in noting Petrarch's support of Dirienzo's 1347 populist revolution in Rome, mm -hmm. uh, you interestingly underline that Petrarch's writings express an act of opposition against these very Roman institutional authorities that he leans on for mm -hmm. the construction of, of his own poetic authority. Um, I think as you demonstrate qu quite clearly, um, he was quite insecure about this symbolic uh, cultural authority mm -hmm. he felt threatened by in his influence over the Pope. He felt threatened by an entire profession of doctors. <laughs> um, he felt threatened perhaps by the shadow of Dante's vernacularity. Um, can you expand more on why you believe Petrarch was willing to subvert these very institutions that offered him temporal influence in the first place, say mm. in contrast to the poetic strategies of Dante and Musato? Right, no, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, you know, a lot of Petrarch's, um, it's really a, like, what, what Petrarch did was he, he constructed an idea of Rome that would be able to grant him a certain kind of authority. Um, with full knowledge that the Roman institutions, the, um, you know, that Rome itself as a city and as a political body um, was not the Rome that he was imagining, right? So he's, I think he's completely aware in the coronation oration that 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 Rome no longer exists, right? And um, what I do, I, what I what I think is going on. The reason he's insecure it, is because it doesn't exist. It, it is a kind of uh, imaginary authority, just like it's an imaginary phantasmatical Rome of memory that he's trying to bring memory back and instantiate it in the present. Um, and uh, so, you know, I think what he did with Claudio Rienzo, I mean, he who you know took over uh, Rome <clears throat> and. Uh, alienated himself from the papacy in Avignon. I mean, he was trying, I think at the forefront of his mind was he, there's something needed to happen to bring the papacy back to Rome. And the only way that was going to happen is if the noble families of, of Rome were put under control, right? Um, unfortunately, you know, his way into the papal court was through uh, Cardinal Colonna. And, you know, and so he was involved as well in the situation in Rome. And so I think whenever that fell apart, when Colonna di Enzo, you know, and that, that experiment fails and fails very bloodily and dramatically, um, Petrarch is, is isolated from the papal court. And I think he frames that isolation um, in terms of a bitter and vitriolic rejection of a certain class of advisors to the pope, you know, the, the physicians, the, the, and he, which he, he goes after them and the invectives against the physician. And he frames his rejection of those advisors as a rejection of the city place, as a, as a, of, of the city as a place uh, of civic engagement. Right? And he establishes himself as beyond that, as outside of that sphere of engagement, right? So, and in fact, once he leaves Avignon, he doesn't call, after the invectives against the physician, he doesn't call himself a poet anymore. Okay, so <laughs> I mean, he doesn't, need to, he doesn't need it anymore because he's already established. Because in that coronation oration, he was already kind of selling himself to the highest bidder. I mean, the idea was, I, as a poet, can make you immortal. <laughs> okay, so he was, in exchange for that, he thought that he could have an impact on the historical developments and the, perhaps the, the, the cessation of, of war in, 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 in northern Italy, for example. I think that was on his agenda, right? If the ecclesiastical gambit failed, then the 
political gambit of bringing together the principates of northern Italy, at least putting them to, at peace with each other, that was what he would do next. And so um, he no longer needed that Rome. <laughs> right? to, to, he no longer needed that imaginary Rome to give himself that kind of authority because he actually achieved it without, without Rome, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Right. Okay. On that note, mm -hmm. thank you so much, David Lummis, for joining us and for coming to Harvard. Oh, it's it my was, pleasure. It was a pleasure to listen to your work on your book, and really looking forward to reading more from you soon. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Goodbye.